Well, I'm here to talk to you about this uh, 50 bridge project that's consumed uh, four years of my life. It's going to go fast, so I'll try to speak clearly. So to give you, we'll start out with the presentation, a little bit about the seating for this project, uh, the background, then get into the bridge needs identification and some of the tools that we came up with to help us deliver the project. Uh, then cover how we develop priorities within this 50 bridge project and uh, lastly finish out with the project review and some of the lessons learned. Uh, my introduction to the project happened in January 2013 when a meeting was called over at Metro and, and we had uh, heard there was uh, 30 million in unallocated funding that had to be spent by the end of the fiscal year. So all the functional groups met over there, we had two hours of briefing on uh, the funding and how uh, where the project limits might be. Um, and then we're told, uh, well, we need your estimates by the end of the day. Uh, I don't know if any of you have seen the movie Rat Race, but this is the closest approximation I've ever experienced. For three hours, I met with uh, some district bridge maintenance engineers scoping the bridges along the corridor. We looked at uh, overlay years, uh, how old they were, whether, which joints were leaking, some coatings, and, and which, what we could deliver by June. Later that night, we received an email that said the money that was available for the project and was rapidly being pursued seems to have been an accounting error downtown. So you laugh so hard you cry. But this was actually a good thing because it really gave us a kick in the pants uh, to deliver this project, uh, which uh, was in fiscal 17. We continued with the mantra, do whatever it takes to stay out of the corridor for 15 to 20 years. So this project, uh, if we look at Minneapolis area, um, I-94 kind of runs north-south along uh, the river there. And there's a, a whole host of needs there between bridge needs and pavement needs. And it's really the merging of uh, two separate entities that grew together to grow this project. Um, as we looked at the traffic control to do this project, we started realizing that it's going to be shut down and there's some extensions of the project that would enable some bridge preservation. So many of the needs here were driven by the opportunities with the traffic control or uh, the optimization. Looking along this corridor, we have a lot of crossings and a lot of mainline bridges. So it just became a, a daunting task. Uh, the, the focus of the project was this tile repair. Uh, it, it was a primary need, and there was an unreinforced barrier to the east of it that had been impacted several times. Uh, inside the tunnel, this 1967 tunnel, the tile was original. We were seeing delamination and car fires in there and, and damaged tile. So that was part of the project. Uh, outside of there, we had different substructure and superstructure needs. If you look along the area north of the Lowry Tunnel, we've got some beams that are exposed to this uh, snowplow throw, and they've uh, seen quite a bit of deterioration. We've got a lot of pier caps in that area uh, that needed work. And to start out, that became a $13 million uh, project. We had our bridge maintenance dollars for the tile and for bridge preservation. Well, in 2015, we had a fiscal, or two other projects or three other projects shifted out of 15 and then uh, it increased our budget uh, for this project. In fact, all the Metro bridge maintenance funds were allocated to the project. Uh, we had 18 million total allocated. It's like saying we're all in. So to sort out the priorities, we kept that mantra, stay out of the corridor for 15 to 20 years. And we looked at the priorities. First is public safety. We got to address the structural needs. Uh, second, we knew that tile work had to be done, and then we looked at uh, some of the activities. If we wanted to do the preservation activities to avoid another service interruption, and then also uh, what activities we could do as a result of the traffic interruption. And then lastly, there was a tunnel. Uh, the tunnel had some railings and barrier that was deteriorated, and uh, it was thought that that should be rehabbed as well. Well, the locals thought that was a pretty high priority and they had the ear of um, our commissioner and that became our number three priority. So how do you uh, attack this project? First, we have all, we invested in tools. Uh, we looked at GPR surveys and ordered those for our larger bridge deck areas. We did some chaining to verify on selected decks. The bridge maintenance crews did that. And then we had a, a brims bridge 
spreadsheet. Uh, it's how we uh, rank our bridges for risk of service interruption. And that also predicts a remaining service life, inter, uh, service life prediction that'll help guide us. Uh, we had several projects leading up to this where we gained some experience in new technology like metallizing and anodes. We had a hydro demolition project that had gained us some experience and we'd heard good things from the last several Midwest Bridge Preservation Conferences about it. And then during the uh, tunnel washings, we sounded the tunnel tiles to the best of our ability. Geographically, we needed some new tools as well. Um, Google Earth enabled a lot of representation of our bridges and we were able to capture uh, the power of that with our SIMS database, which exports the bridge numbers to uh, a KML file. And then we were able to generate a uh, tag for that, which gave you all the relevant information uh, about a bridge and help you do a spot check. These tags, it gave you quick updates about the programming notes, the brim ranking, the age of the structure, uh, load rating, and some of the uh, major condition states like um, expansion joint condition and deck condition. And then while you're in there, you can get some quick street view looks. We also invested in a consultant contract to look at some of the major bridge areas and map out delamination. They had hired uh, Vector Corrosion Services as a subconsultant to give us some guidelines and uh, also look at a few locations to develop some strategies. We took that data and uh, I was ultimately charged with developing the repairs out of this inspection data. Another investment came in the form of bridge improvement form. Um, this is a kind of a planning worksheet where you identify the work and you can cost out at the same time. Uh, I know Michigan has something very similar and at the bottom uh, you can spit out a rehab to replace ratio and it gives you a guideline for how your investment is going. Now we took that and uh, carried it laterally so we could do a project summation as we went. Now looking back at that mat mantra, stay out of the quarter, we had to decide what does that really mean? And to us it meant le the least traffic interruption in the future. So a, a complex area like this with the tunnel on the south has a lot of connected bridges on that system. So we started looking at the connected bridges as part of this project and the traffic control uh, for where we might obtain some benefit. As we carried this uh, to the adjacent ramps, we realized that one of the largest bridge deck areas in Minnesota is just to the west of this location. And this one's got a 1967 deck with a 1977 wear course. So we really got to get a handle on what that is bringing to us in the next coming years for programming. So we did extend uh, some of our preservation treatment onto that bridge to capture uh, what deck repair areas we might encounter if we chose to go with another overlay. So where to stop though? First of all, we have to take a breath and say, this is maintenance. We are not gonna make everything new. Uh, we saved the redex for areas that we don't think there's gonna be expansion. Um, this central location, we just can't foresee um, major changes in the capacity there, or, or we can't see the capacity being uh, just kept there. So we saved those uh, capital infusions for other areas. Again, we went back to public safety as number one. So we waffled between 50 bridges, went up to 57, and finally landed back at 50 bridges just to stay within budget. But looking at the project uh, from the north end, we quickly eliminated three bridges that were kind of uh, standalone, and we could do that in another project. Uh, but one of the bridges we did attack, this is a 1980 uh, bridge, it's a slab span. And the crews really had a hard time keeping up a crack ceiling on this. So it became uh, one of the priorities. Uh, installation also has some pile deterioration and we had wanted to get at that, but it, it was deemed like a, a standalone project and we can defer that. Construction results, we did do the overlay, the low slump overlay there, and we did experience some cracking. So we had to write an essay to do the uh, flood seal by uh, 30 days later. Other bridges in this area were built around 1980. There's a lot of overpasses and we're not really having the budget to attack those. So what we're focusing on is the public risk of the concrete cover on the bottom. 
Uh, we have an item called sound and remove loose concrete, and basically we're paying for access so they can chip and uh, get any loose stuff off uh, to prevent it from falling on the roadway. Uh, in the past, we've painted that reinforcement, but at $30 a square foot, it seems like it, it may not give us the best value if the joints, if the cracks are still leaking above. For these bridges, they have some columns in the median with high exposure. Um, they had been patched before, and we decided to uh, patch any loose stuff and then wrap a FRP around those as protection and confinement. Um, over that area, we're going to use a uh, high build epoxy protective coating and then fix that settled median. Uh, our experience with FRP, we knew we had some FRP needs in this project, so we had a maintenance contract. Uh, in 2015, we're, or not a contract, but we went out with maintenance forces to get some familiarity with the installation. Um, we did three column treatments. The columns were repaired uh, the year prior, but we came back and did the FRP wraps, and then we uh, applied the high build epoxy coating on uh, one column with the FRP and one column without, and the remainder of the columns had a, a text coat. It's a breathable masonry coating. So we gained some familiarity with the FRP, and the main interest in FRP for these locations is because we're usually seeing a lot of cracking in the shotcrete. Um, it's just hard to cure any material you put on these things in a wet cure, and uh, Without any confinement, we still feel that that moisture is going to creep in there and restart that corrosion process. In fact, there are a lot of papers that I'll just page through here about the benefits of FRP and uh, the additional uh, confinement it can give you and, and what it might do for your corrosion rate. So I like to look at these repairs as branched out into sensitive strategies where you're trying to match the elastic modulus and thermal modulus and shrinkage and get that really low. And maybe you need some load relief to activate the patch and get it to participate. Otherwise, uh, these FRP solutions might be a more robust strategy where you're, you're removing the new water intrusion and you're providing external confinement and you can also put in some cathodic protection. Uh, at the north end also we have this ramp. It's a two-lane uh, bridge that's very high capacity, or high, high ADT. It's 1963 construction. It was redecked once in 1981. But this was a priority, and we did put our money in this as the only redeck on the project. We now do our decks with high-performance concrete and a mix of macro and microfibers. We do not reduce the rebar, um, but we are getting some good success with this. We're seeing fewer cracks and uh, MnDOT's moving to all this uh, type of construction. This particular bridge had high skew and a curved alignment, so we did have to use uh, a low slump overlay on it to make sure we got to ride. Other bridges in this area, we have uh, a lot of them along the route that are just overpasses built in the early 80s. The deck condition on the undersides are in generally good condition, but we wanted to use the traffic control below to repair the substructures. A couple of these I want to highlight, they were post on, uh, these weren't overpasses, they're mainline bridges. Um, they were constructed in 1982 and there was cracking out there. It's hard to, for maintenance crews to get out there to crack seal and keep up with it. Uh, the inside of these looked really good, so we decided to use a low slump overlay um, to uh, preserve this bridge. The box, as a box girder, we're not sure how you replace a top flange, and that remains a, a risk on our system. We invested in an overlay there and joint replacement. We also put uh, what's called a split median steel. This is uh, something Metro Bridge Maintenance came up with. It's uh, you can look at it after presentation, but it, uh, it seals the two barriers that kind of have a one inch gap between them. We see the underside of the deck corrode out a lot of times from the moisture that's trapped and coming down between bridges. So we've kind of gone to doing this install on most of those median barriers. Some of the lessons from this, uh, we were a little worried about the post tension anchors, but they were successful in removing around those for the expansion joints. The low slump that we placed did crack heavily. That's not a good attribute for a box girder. So we, by a supplemental agreement, we ended up putting a polyester overlay on that to seal up that box girder and preserve the, the structure. 
And there's the, the cracking that a little more blown up for you. Um, other bridges along this route, I want to just highlight uh, some of the surprises. Uh, we didn't pay a lot of attention, perhaps not as much as we should, on some of these overpasses. This bridge was redecked in 2011 by Hennepin County, and we saw some deterioration of the substructure. And we estimated, well, it's about 40 square feet. Uh, I didn't dig into the design because we had a lot of other priorities. And we had a pier that we also had some concrete surface repair out there on. So the thing that ended up happening is the quantity just ballooned. There was 750, 750 square feet actual repair quantity, and that added 115,000 to the project. If we had sounded this abutment wall, we would have done a form and pour repair, and it would have been a much better investment. Uh, yeah, and this is just kind of showing uh, the importance of that because that bearing wall is only a foot and a half thick. Now, as we move south, there's this farmer's market area uh, that is a big focus of the project. Uh, built around 1980, um, it has the original low slump wearing course. It goes over parking in city streets, and there are um, steel continuous spans over the railroad. Below, it's just a forest of piers, so we hired a consultant contract to map the delamination and help us out. We had some GPR data, but we did chain to verify. What we found is there was really low deep lamination in that deck. There was cracking, um, but it seemed like with the low de delamination and good integrity, we could uh, settle for localized patching and crack sealing. We also put on an uh, ultra-thin bonded wear course uh, after micro-milling a half inch. That is uh, something Metro has been pleased with since uh, a 2008 installation where we started this. Uh, it's, it was done side by side with a concrete overlay, and we do see after seven years in service some uh, deterioration near the joints from the plows on abrasion, but uh, another installation on heavier ADT roadway on US 10, um, this is held up as well. So this is the project application. They do apply like a tackifier that's uh, almost impermeable for the asphalt product. And looking at the square footage here, we've got almost 320,000 square feet of deck area. Um, a mill and overlay at $6.75. A square foot would have busted the budget. Uh, a flood seal alone would have costed us more than what this mill and uh, Nova chip actually cost us. So we thought it was a good strategy to reduce new chlorides into the deck and remove the continued moisture absorption. There was one bridge southwest of here, the Aqua Blue Bridge, that was curved steel. It had a history of DLAM and higher cracking. So we didn't feel that was a good candidate, and we did go with the low slump uh, wearing course. Looking at how the contract quantities came out, we had some GPR data that suggested very high uh, removal limits. Based on the chaining, we didn't feel that that was really uh, fair, um, and so we took almost half of that and put it in for a planned quantity. The contractor geared up for this, and they only used like 11 to 20 percent of the actual planned quantity. So we were uh, feeling pretty good about our uh, continuation of that existing uh, low slump overlay. One of the reasons is we just had a lot of cover there. It was about four inches of cover uh, over the rebar. Now there's some other superstructure needs in this just based on uh, the configuration. There are these parallel ramps that come down and meet the roadway that the, the plows throw snow against. Um, that has really deteriorated the beams. Uh, this is one of the fascias. Um, we did hire the consultant to go map that deterioration and they found four strands that were definitely compromised. We've low rated that and found that being a fascia beam, it had some extra reserve and uh, we were fine with the load rating. Uh, we came up with a repair nonetheless that restored some strength with carbon fiber and then uh, a distributed anode along the top. Vector corrosion assisted with this uh, configuration. And then to uh, prevent further chloride ingress, we put a high build epoxy coating on the surface. Uh, and then looking at how construction turned out, the contractor was very uh, accelerated in this repair, and they did it without a lot of inspection that we had hoped to get documented removals. 
and I see that they didn't put the distributed anode in to our satisfaction. They ended up putting it only in the patches, so we may have to go back next year and finish off the cathodic protection. At the beam ends, we do have the joints, uh, and we've came, come up with a cathodic protection detail that's uh, implemented in the lower right picture. This uh, is basically an anode in a mortar that's attached to the beam. Uh, it does provide some uh, corrosion protection. We also had a, a whole list of these uh, sole plates. For whatever reason, the original construction had a two foot long sole plate with no anchors into the beam. So over time, that sole plate just kind of curled away from the beam and developed pack rust. Our solution was to cut it back, sandblast it, cold galvanize it, and then inject epoxy to remove the uh, void in there and then perform some concrete surface repair. There's still other locations out there with heavy uh, beam deterioration, and those got a beam and reconstruction. Uh, that's in the lower right and the finished product. I'll talk a little bit more about that tomorrow. Uh, other needs in this area, we had some significant substructure demands. They had expansion joints every other pier, and like I said, there's a lot of exposures. We had so many uh, piers down there. We had two column piers, we had bi-level piers, I've got uh, hammerhead piers, a whole series of them, multi-column piers and shaft piers, and fracture critical straddle bents. These are all in the 1980 era. Um, so we developed a methodology to this. First, get a pier DLAM survey on all faces, uh, generate some quantities, uh, figure out how many areas extend underneath the bearings, and then determine our temporary support needs. Uh, after doing that, you can look at a repair alternatives and consider the risks and then cost them out and figure out what do, our, what do I need to structure to last and, and when's the next project. Uh, shoring is a big challenge. I think other states are dealing with this as well. We developed um, a range of shoring options from the least complex to most. Uh, the least complex would just be using the existing substructure, a little bit more engineered works than type B. Type B almost be, may also be a prefabricated bracket. We've got uh, some commercial towers and a Type C. Uh, type D might depend on the uh, pier itself for stability. And then Type E is a, a much more engineered uh, shoring installation. Now here's what a Type E might look like. And then we got what I call the Jenga shoring. Um, this was actually used on a project. Uh, we developed a matrix for the shoring, and it's mainly aimed at uh, giving the contract more inf contractor more information of what our expectations are for submittals. Um, we did have constructability reviews with the contractors talking specifically about shoring, and they said for liability standpoint, they don't want to be dealing with the live load. Um, so we, and they also said we need the reactions. We can't do all this analysis for a short ad. Uh, we did feel we still had to review it as a public owner. Um, they had said, well, we're assuming all the liability. Why do you need to do all these reviews? And we disagree with that. Ultimately, I think we'd be hauled in. Shoring uh, design review, we did agree that we have to dedicate some resources and turn them around quick. And uh, we agreed that it'd be a lump sum per bridge with the number of locations and type assumed. Uh, the contract came in between 2,800 and 8,700 per location to fully support a pier and replace it, about 6,250 per beam location. Uh, some of the substructure, uh, I'll go over a case study here. Uh, Collins Engineers provided this DLAM map. This is what the picture might look like. Uh, it was good because we got a glimpse of the deterioration and leaking and got some quantities, but I didn't really have a lot of info on the underside and top faces, not enough for what I need to do. I went ahead and asked uh, the bridge maintenance crews to sound areas around these bearings. Uh, and I merged that data with uh, the Collins uh, graphics and some pictures to get a, a complete picture of what's going on there. From that, you could really identify shoring locations and do a, a structural assessment of uh, what shoring demands there were. So this has become kind of the new standard for uh, scoping. 
determining temporary support is a problem. There's a lot of things that are unknowns. You don't know. Uh, first of all, you might know uh, if it's going to go under the beam. That's a gimme. You're going to need the support there. But we don't have a good handle on how much column removals we can do uh, without shoring. Uh, pier overhangs typically will need to be supported. We don't have a handle on rebar development, how much the excavation is going to go. Uh, sequencing should be done as a last resort. It really drags out a job and, and the stage as well. So this is how it might look in the spec or how it looked in the spec. We had identified the purpose of the shoring, uh, whether it be a beam, pier, or column uh, relief. And then the beam location was identified with the type of shoring assumed. And then we totaled up that shoring for a particular bridge and it was bid as lump sum. After doing, generating those, we could uh, look at uh, the repair alternatives. Uh, some of the assumptions we went in with is a temporary support was about 7,500, uh, removal of concrete about 500, and replacement with reinforcement about 1,800 yards. I won't go through the repair pier cap assumptions in the interest of time, but we do have uh, several alternates that we would look at and repair, uh, generate a repair to replacement ratio to come up with the best option for durability. And in the end, uh, another concept was developed where you could uh, cast a second pier cap below the first one and reduce your shoring demand because you don't have to repair all that first pier cap. So this is how it shook out for one particular bridge. The unit prices can significantly uh, affect your results, and so it's good to develop a longer history with these. So a case study here, um, uh, for this particular pier, I said let's put a second pier cap in there and then come back and repair the areas underneath the bearing. Um, that could be done without traffic control ahead of the project. And then for areas with lesser concrete repair, you could probably do that uh, with just uh, shotcrete. Now, when the designers looked at it, they could not make that second pier cap work. So they, about a month before letting, I found out they were doing infill walls. Um, there was no time to change it, and I had to accept it. Uh, this is what an infill wall looks like. Since we didn't really look at the, how it compared to the scope cost, uh, the actual cost increased quite a bit. We ended up at 174000 and we really could have replaced the pier cap. But there are some contributing uh, circumstances. The high ADT, the limited closure time were really a challenge, so we might have ended up back at the infill wall solution. Uh, also, I had thought that maybe you could limit your concrete surface repair since you're uh, taking away the flexural component of the bridge pier cap. And I thought, well, just do the areas underneath the bearing and let it get to the wall. Well, the inspection did not hold them to that, even though we had a plan note. They said we just couldn't keep the chippers <laughs> at bay and ended up being a huge escalation in the shock cost. Uh, there's some pier caps out there that are just not worth saving. Uh, we ended up having these being fully replacement piers. Uh, another pier I'd like to look at is this one as a two-column pier. Uh, I got the sounding map, and perhaps I didn't appreciate uh, that sounding map as much as I should have, but we did ask for shoring in there. Uh, and when they got out there, they removed the drainage trough, tapped it with a hammer on a Friday, and it all came down like a sheet. So I got the call and we had to put in emergency uh, banding t for the weekend until they could come back and put up the shoring. Uh, that solution there was a uh, concrete collar that was basically re replacement reinforcement into the footing. Uh, one of the things you might notice is that a lot of the pier cap is chipped and the infill wall isn't installed. So uh, communication with the contractor is important. We did have a sequence, but uh, they, just didn't control them the way we would, look, would have liked. Uh, and this was a uh, continual trend, and we sent a stern letter to the contractor that you have to have the shoring in first. Uh, the infill walls are just not for aesthetics. So uh, it's just an education piece for the labor force out there. Um, we did get it under hand, though, but... So uh, some of the field direction I gave the contractor is remove only the loose concrete prior to casting that infill wall. You can sandblast the steel. In fact, we do you want you to do that, but then get the infill wall in. Uh, don't chase the bad concrete. The infill wall is going to bear and um, take up the load without much deflection. 
and then locate the internal steel before drilling a bunch of holes into our columns because that's how they started. Some of the other lessons learned is that previous repaired pier caps, you gotta, you gotta watch out for those. They will have significant rebar losses. This is another location where we told them don't be chipping and we ended up uh, putting up the uh, info, wall, info wall really quick. But we do have to come grips with that DLAM has probably been there a while and it's probably being load tested every day. So it's something to be aware of in your routine inspections uh, and have structural analysis done if you have any doubts. In all, we did 16 infill walls, 10 went over to scoping cost. There's really very little design, uh, but you should check the percent increase in the foundation loads. And you'll still need to get the areas underneath the bearings and do temporary support. Those infill walls cost between $64 and $82. Uh, much of it is tied up in the concrete cost at $1,235 a cubic yard as bid. This is what they look like. Uh, Scope to repair, make sure the designer understands your repairs. I need some time to plan a review. I would have perhaps had them off sooner on some of them because infill walls everywhere do create some nice placards for people to put their tag on and they all cre also create uh, some less secure public spaces. Uh, some of the lessons are it just, I don't know that I'll be able to go through all these, but we do need guidance on when to shore maybe some temporary uh, load factors for the limited duration, how we estimate rebar losses visually, um, how we load rate sections that are deteriorated and, and exposed during construction. Because um, it's just a, a lot of questions out there in tacking rehab that we should perhaps get together and, and pool a study. Uh, some of the other lessons learned, scoping with detailed sounding maps is worth the investment. We did implement a lot of FRP out there. As a, it's an alternative to an infill wall if your concrete surface for here is not extensive. We do require shop drawings, and the bid prices came in pretty good on that stuff. We had the engineer of record document all the removals, and that process we highly recommend. It enabled accurate FRP placement because a lot of times, or most of the time, the uh, applicators out there is when everything's repaired. It is a good record of what's covered up. Now, we do need to dedicate more inspection staff during the construction. Uh, this was done on a Saturday, and uh, the crew walked away, and there's all these air voids in it. Um, the subcontractor discontinued their construction arm as of 2017, about halfway through the project, and that uh, we never got the spec uh, samples or daily work samples or wrapping logs. So it's uh, a little disappointing in that regard. Other strategies, cathodic protection, we, uh, we've got about 10 years experience putting it in substructures. Um, our preference is for passive anodes. Some of the challenges with anodes is that it's difficult to quantify for bidding. We, we don't have a handle on how much uh, DLAM and where those areas are gonna be. Um, we can't get the, uh, we, the contractors, they need that uh, quantity in order to order and be on site for their removals because they want to keep moving. In general, the anode prices have been very high for what we're getting and the contractors have pretty low knowledge about the placement. Um, our recommendations after learning on this job and elsewhere is that uh, it seems like pier caps and most columns have a very high steel density. We should probably be going for the larger anodes, the distributed, or be switching to a metallized solution. These little pucks just are like throwing a double A battery at a car battery to start it. Um, so it's kind of a waste of money if they're not pro properly sized and placed. Uh, contractors also have a misunderstanding of the anodes that we found out. It seems like they thought we have to create these pockets everywhere for the anode, but that's in fact not true. You just need some low resistivity paste uh, connecting it to the old concrete. Another lesson learned is don't put anodes where the re bars are fully excavated. You know, it doesn't do you a lot good there. If the chlorides are in the concrete that you're trying to protect uh, the steel from. So you gotta have it next or in the old concrete. And then check your expectations. Uh, sometimes the old concrete's just not worth saving. Here's an example of good anode sizing and placement. Uh, if you have a, a limited amount of uh, concrete surface repair and there's a lot of unrepaired concrete that probably has chlorides, metallizing is probably the right solution for you. Um, it, it does provide a good current and we had some really good results out here. You need at least a thousand square feet to get a good price though. Looking at this farmer's market area, we did that uh, replacement ratio, and it seems like we got good value for our dollar um, in preserving these bridges. Between, uh, it's certainly less than 15% of a replacement cost. 
Uh, as an extension to this project, I mentioned early there were, there is a some need to program uh, future deck areas adjacent to the project and so we did elect to replace joints and continue the low slump onto that deck. Sometimes it's helpful to anticipate problems prior to the activity. Okay, I'm gonna wind it up, but uh, one thing I'll mention is that this one was a box girder and uh, we foresaw if those deck removals got pretty large, we could be into some real trouble. Uh, so we ended up preemptively shoring those ahead of the job. We had some pile section loss below this structure. We did some concrete collars there. Secondary to the route, there were some bridges that we needed pier struts on, two column piers with high exposure. We did try hydro demolition on this project. We had that backdrop. Uh, our experience with hydro demo um, is that it, it perhaps was not meeting expectations. We had heard good things, but we found it was insufficient to remove the delamination below. It left a lot of pockets of delamination, and they had to do a lot of chipping. It's really a lengthy process to do in a short-term closure uh, in a highly demanding contract. So we're going to revisit this and, and figure out how to optimize it. Uh, for the prices that we received. Also, we had some low slump cracking on those mainline bridges. Uh, we're exploring different ways uh, to improve our cracking performance, and one of them is uh, this flex gear that's in the booth out here. Um, but we're also looking at silicone fume overlays. To the east, we, I won't stick too long on this. We did have the tile replacement, um, which is kind of an outlier. I'm not gonna dwell on that. Um, but we did have this tunnel seal that I've talked to Michigan about. Um, <clears throat> the, leak, the roof was leaking since about 1970 and it's been creating icicles over traffic. So we wanted a, a quick and dirty repair that maintenance could deal with. And we ended up with a, a MCO joint in the uh, roof, followed by polyurethane grout as like a backer to make sure it uh, didn't fall out. So this was, was successful and uh, we redirected it, the water to the wall and then had a wall deflector there to make sure that all that moisture didn't get into our walls. So it just drips down on the gutter line. Uh, so we'll see how this turns out over the coming years. It seems like it's working, um, but if it doesn't, you know, we can just tear it out and, and be back at square one. So looking at our priorities, I'd say that we did accomplish them. Uh, the mantra, stay out of the quarter for 15 to 20, I guess uh, time will tell, but um, it was a major project. I've got a lot of slides I didn't show that I'm, I'm um, open to sharing with anybody. The preceding video was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found at tsp2.org. That's tsp2.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.